Good evening. Please, how do I describe you? Professor or chairman or what? How do I start? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and I must uh, I address the, the ambassador of Ghana to uh, Germany, who is here with me. I want to thank you for coming. I'm delighted to be here today as a keynote speaker at this all-important Berlin Economic Forum for this year. The theme for this year's forum, Sustainable Business and Respons Responsible Investments, could not have been more apt given the rapidly accelerating and changing international economic and social order. I appreciate that the forum seeks to raise international awareness on such issues as sustainable development, climate change, and environmental responsibility, social and economic inequalities, fair trade, corporate social responsibility, and socially responsible investments, all for the good of mankind and the planet Earth. These are very laudable ideals that must be situated at the core of humanity's quest to build a fairer world system that serves not only those of us who happen to be alive today, but also the generations yet to, be, to, to come. In the part of the world that I come from, Africa, which is a continent that has more developing countries than anywhere else. There is the stark death of industrialization and technological application for economic development. We have fragile economies, although the continent has more arable lands than any other continent on the globe. Our lands have loads of mineral wealth and natural resources and water bodies that compare favorably with other continents. For instance, the Congo River, which is one of the world's mightiest river, uh, rivers, has been studied to be capable of generating over 40,000 megawatts of electricity at its proposed Grand Inga Dam site. It is the world's largest proposed hydropower scheme and the centerpiece of a grand vision to develop a continent-wide renewable power system for the whole continent and beyond. But in spite of the study that was done many years ago, it is yet to attract the requisite investment. Such an investment, if done, would be responsible as well as sustainable, considering the immense impact it will have on the improvement of lives on the most challenged continent on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, without seeking to apologize for the many handicaps Africa suffers, I feel constrained to state that history and geography have without a doubt conspired to contribute to some of the continent's handicaps. However, over the past two decades, the continental body, the African Union, with its regional groupings and its 55 member nations, has come around to make some specific proposals for tackling the challenges. It has stated unequivocally that the only way for the nations and the continent as a whole to free themselves from the quagmire of poverty and debilitating drawbacks to their development must be through seeking industrial and economic partnerships, both domestically and internationally. This is why the African Union set up the institution called the New Partnership for Africa's development, 
and which is staffed by competent technocrats with global exposure to lead in the con continent's developmental efforts. With this for background, talk of responsible investments should immediately import a thoroughly studied field of investments for legitimate profit for all stakeholders, ideally on win-win public-private partnership basis. Almost 60 years after independence, African economies are still trapped in the exploitative colonial mode of largely producing raw materials for export, whether it be in mining, drilling of hydrocarbons, forestry resources, or agriculture without any value addition. Obviously, this should explain much of the dependency and poverty syndrome the continent finds itself in. For example, Ghana, my country, which is the world's second largest producer of cocoa beans, and not more than 3 billion United States dollars from cocoa exports annually, while the total world cocoa value chain amounts to over 120 billion United States dollars annually. The point here is that there is a great loss to the farmer and the national economy from the lack of any meaningful local value addition to the beans to benefit the nation and the people from the value chain. Examples of such losses of opportunity abound in other sectors of the economy. Mineral ores like gold, bauxite, manganese, diamonds, and iron have all been ex extracted and exported without any meaningful value addition over the past several decades by totally foreign companies. Similarly, our forests have been decimated without much replanting or processing to add value to our forest products locally. For instance, hardwoods such as mahogany, aphromosia, mansonia, sapele, and many others that averagely take much longer than 50 years to fully mature have suffered indelible decimation without any value addition in their exploitation and are now very hard to come by locally. Between 1990 and the year 2010 alone, the country lost 34% of its total forest cover, which in 1960 covered 60 to 70% of its land mass. Therefore, whatever investments that were used in the exploitation of these resources without creating local value addition to enhance revenues and, job, and jobs for the people substantially cannot be said to be responsible investments and supportive of sustainable development of our economy. Mr. Chairman, the reality of the global situation would seem that mankind until very recently has tended to use the planet's resources as if these resources were limitless. In so doing, great damage has been done to the environment, climate, habitats, ecological balance, and even our social relationships with dangerous chemicals such as arsenic and mercury having found their way into water bodies that serve as drinking water for the people. Some of these occurrences have created conflicts and destabilization of societies. Mankind has not shown adequate seriousness for the sustainability of whatever 
we do in search of economic prosperity. It seems that mankind has been short-sighted and not comprehending enough of the balance that nature prescribes for sustainable living on the planet. Paradoxically, it has taken two cataclysmic world wars and scientific and technological revolutions following from them within the past century, especially after the Second World War, to rudely awaken mankind from its generally inadvertent abuse of the resources of our universe. Mr. Chairman, looking through the rearview mirror of recent history, I believe that there have been three major points of beneficent radical change in global social evolution. And these are, firstly, the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Secondly, the signing of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, of the United Nations in September 2015. And thirdly, the December 2015 United Nations Paris Accord on Climate Change uh, called COP21. Through all these promulgations, the community of nations, practically all of them, at least in principle, has at long last come to accept the centrality of the human individual in the affairs of human society and also the security of the planet Earth. The three resolutions prescribe a new paradigm for the pursuit of economic and social evolution with a conscience and knowledge to underpin sustainability. It is against this background that I expect investors and, and entrepreneurs going about their duty of seeking returns on their investments. Two, at all material times, consider what is the public good side by side with the profits on their investments. And the state should ensure this with enlightened regulatory mechanisms. The point here is that individual well-being would be best served when situated in a good and stable society. To be able to realize these lofty ideals, the state must accept to partner the private sector to formulate and implement policies with a shared and, 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 and enlightened vision where the state sets the framework of enablement for the private sector to operate as an engine of growth without undue excesses in the markets. This should be the way to achieve balance between reasonable investments or responsible investments and sustainable development. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the world still abounds in destructive practices across the development divide through the extractive industries, agriculture, deforestation, burning of fossil fuels, industrial pollution, and many others, all in pursuit of profit without due regard for the safety and security of humanity and our planet. But it is worthy of note that over much of the decades of the 20th century, the international community did not seem to appreciate and deliberate on the environment and sustainable development until the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, dubbed the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Here, economic development was tied to the environment and sustainability of our world. At that summit in Rio de Janeiro, the international community tied the destinies of all peoples of the world together. 
and called for the sustainability of our planet in our economic development decisions and actions. Of the 27 principles that were adopted at the Earth Summit, some salient ones relevant to our discussion tonight are worth mentioning here. Principle one stated, human beings are the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. Principle three stated, the right to development must be fulfilled so as to equitably meet development and environmental needs of present and future generations. Principle four stated that in order to achieve sustainable development, environmental protection shall constitute an integral part of the development process and cannot be recognized in isolation from it. Principle five, all states and all people shall cooperate in the essential task of eradicating poverty as an indispensable requirement for sustainable development in order to decrease the disparities in standards of living and better meet the needs of the majority of the peoples of the world. Principle six, the special situation and needs of developing countries, particularly the least developed and those most environmentally vulnerable shall be given special priority. International actions in the field of environment and development should also address the interests and needs of all countries. My friends, without a doubt, these are very powerful essential ideals which must underpin a sustainable human civilization. Investors and business people should be better well off long term on a sustainable basis if humanity generally is better served through investments that restore the environment as close as possible to how nature has had it after their economic activities. This is owed to posterity of future generations of mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, following from the first Rio Earth Summit, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was subsequently born, or should I say consequently born. Through the work of the UNFCCC, and a sister organization, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is now well established that man has substantially contributed to global warming and climate change. The scientific community has established beyond a reasonable doubt that ozone depleting greenhouse emissions, for example, from the burning of fossil fuels for energy, are a major culprit in causing climate change. The IPCC has long sounded the alarm about the devastating effects that climate change is having on ecosystems, health, agriculture, food production, coastal settlements, island nations, and many others, and ultimately, the overall sustainability of our life itself, as we have known it on our planet Earth. The IPCC is thus urging all parties to do all they can to limit the rise in global temperatures to not more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of this century. Otherwise, the effects of climate change will be irreversible. There is no doubt that our planet Earth is in danger due to the threats posed by climate change. The current generation of humanity, therefore, has a duty to itself and to posterity 
to work urgently and with renewed focus towards arresting the causes of climate change. At, those, at least those signs has helped to identify as caused by mankind. We should collectively be responsible in fighting against climate change by way of the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities, which was enshrined as principle seven of the Rio Declaration at the first Earth Summit 1992. Indeed, as part of efforts to temper the impact of climate change, we are called upon to invest in alternative and renewable energy, such as wind and solar energy, which is proven to show incredible promise. Fighting climate change must go hand in hand with developing sustainably and collectively, and thus the need for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, Goals, which is a plan of action for people, for all people, our planet, and prosperity. The agenda recognizes that the eradication of poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable prerequisite for sustainable development. The human development element of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is essentially the first five goals, together seeks to address the human insecurities of our times. Mr. Chairman, among the essential goals as captured in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are ending poverty in all its forms, ending hunger by achieving food security and improved nutrition through sustainable agriculture or smart agriculture, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages, inclusive and equitable quality education for all, and achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls. The remaining goals are all reinforce the earlier ones to guide the world towards sustainable development of the Earth's resources. Thus, investments made within these dictates would be sustainable as well as responsible. However, Mr. Chairman, the other factor of serious consequence to consider that could unravel the effort to achieve responsible investments and sustainable development might be improperly managed demographics. The current global population is estimated to be over 7 billion. By 2050, this is expected to go about, above 9 billion. And by end of century, well over 10 billion. Currently, the continent of Africa alone is estimated to have about 9% of the current population. By the middle of the century, it is expected to have about 16%. Toward the end of the century, Africa might have as much as 50% of the global population. Talking of responsible investments, Africa woefully lacks in the types of investments that create the necessary and adequate jobs for its peoples. And already, this explains the current spate of hazardous migration of its teeming youth across the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean Sea in search of greener pastures. Thus, it becomes essential that the continental organization, the African Union, should focus on family planning and critical population growth controls mechanisms to ensure that the rate of population growth is kept within the pace of industrial and economic transformation it seeks. In this regard, it should be of primary concern, not only for Africa, but also for the whole international community 
led by the United Nations, to cooperate in assisting Africa manage this crucial challenge. It is absolutely important that the call by the Continental Organization for international partnerships within the framework of NEPAD is heeded and accepted from both within and outside the continent, especially from Europe, which so far has been the point of first destination of the migrants. So as to tackle steady investments vigorously for wealth and job creation on the continent for the mutual benefit of all stakeholders. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, the call for responsible investments is gaining impetus around the world. Similarly, investment in renewables as the way forward to achieve sustainability and biodiversity of the planet's natural resources for continued benefit of humanity is also fast gaining acceptance. Indeed, scientific and technological advances are helping to realize the visions of the global awakening to the essential balance that nature imposes on the evolution of human society. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we must agree that the struggle has only just begun and must be sustained endlessly. I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you.